Welcome to That Moto Show with Dirt Bike TV's Jay Clark and producer Donnie Bales. Number seven. Can you believe that, Donnie? Yeah, we're, we're moving quite along here. It's been a busy week. Uh, we had some big news this last week. We had our FMF to drop. Uh, why don't you stand up and yeah, let, yeah, let's show that the, shirt off. I got this, uh, the J. Clark drop shirt. There we go, the back. Yeah, everybody's kind of seen that. We had it posted all over, so that was really cool. That you, just You came made out. me wear it today. Yeah, <laughs> I showed up because I forgot mine. I was going to bring it to show, and uh, but I think everybody's seen it. And then I'd you be had, like a good employee wearing it. <laughs> right. So Spencer, show the... Got sp we got Spencer. The, yeah, it came with a bead buddy which is a really cool gift and a piston a free piston yeah okay that's pretty cool and then a real good from sticker sheet nice thick one i can't believe from, how thick they are it's yeah real. like from that's, that's, a, that's no like wimpy sticker sheet that's a that's a good one no yeah. that's like that'll a, go on your bike instead. yeah that's decal yeah. sticker stuff. Yeah, yeah and decal works does the graphics for uh, factory ktm you know they do like high level graphics so so it's we got a really cool show today so it's a little bit different we're going to bring in jay dungy who's a, a factory mechanic so we're going to bring him in and, and I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about being a mechanic and those types of things and then get into our questions as well yeah so, that's my wonder why I right to right it. and it just worked out that it was episode seven i thought that was really cool when, when we were doing the uh, last week when we were doing the number six you know yeah i was like hey so that's gonna work out really well you yeah, know it's perfect so, so that was cool so yeah thanks for setting that up uh you know we'll get into it later but he's got connections with grant uh langston our buddy so we can talk about that a little bit and that was cool yeah 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 so anyway so we're getting in here a couple things uh make sure to check out our youtube uh, you know 125 hacks and tips for your dirt bike it's got a lot of stuff for you guys out there that are you know wanting to learn more about your bike we also have that really good in-depth brake bleeding video we get a lot of people who struggle with brake bleeding flushing we got really good tips on that as well so you want to check that out so um i think we'll get uh what's next my, oh my first tip we're gonna do this Donnie showed me this one. He had this, I, I, he didn't show it to me. I just saw it over in his shop. I'm like, Why, what'd you do? He cut your tape in half, you know? And he says he cuts it in quarters sometimes on his little uh, homemade bandsaw he made. And because I only use, I use blue tape a lot because we make notes on the bikes. It's really important. Uh, it's easy. I don't care if you're old or young. It's really easy to forget stuff the, to do. Like you get back, you wash your bike and you're like, okay, I'm going to check the oil and the filter and I got a loose spoke. I'll, I'll throw a piece of tape on a spoke knowing that we need to go back and check it later that hey this way we don't forget anything so having blue tape handy and so what he's done he's cut it so that he can just easily pull off a piece instead of having honestly that. i'm i swear it's that i was i can't stand the way tape torn looks so i'm like i just want it square and i would i would take them off and i would cut them and i'm like well i'm just gonna cut the tape <laughs> So anyway, really cool little tip there. That was fun. And Donnie's like that. He's a baller. He can just, uh, you know, cut up tape. So I thought that was cool. I don't so. think the dollar I spent is <laughs> balling there. So anyway, that was pretty fun. So I think our next step here is, what, what do we do? Just bring in our guests. I think we bring in our guests. All right, let's All right. do it. Okay. Okay, we got Jay Dungey in here, which is really cool. And a lot of people recognize the name, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm Ryan sure you... Dungey's brother. <laughs> I always get at the races. Yes, yeah, so we get that a lot, is that, uh, you know, got a famous last name and, and so forth. So do you ever have fans do that? Like, is your brother here? You Well, they see, like, I have a tattoo from when I was younger. I got my last name and... You'll be at the race, like, oh, are you related to Ryan? I'm like, ask my brother. And they're like, no, you're the, you're, you're the older brother. Yeah, yeah. And then me and Ryan were joking around because when, when AP won San Diego a couple weeks ago, he's like, oh, I'm Jade's brother. So it's kind of <laughs> ah. cool. That's cool. Very cool. So anyway, it's uh, it's it's cool. You're you're at a factory race team. And for those that don't know, you're wrenching for Aaron Plessinger on the factory KTM team. Yeah, yeah. And so that's been last year and this year? This is actually my third year with AP. So, so I started, I came from Honda in 21. Came back to KTM and yeah, I've been with AP since uh, 22. That's awesome. All Is right. that funny that you had Chase at Honda and then now he's back on KTM? Does that? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of small world, but yeah, I think when he was trying to come to KTM, I'd always talk to him and told him it was it's a good place and a lot of room for you to grow. So kind of you guys remain close when yeah, you, I still talk. Nice. You know, we're still buddies and stuff. So that's awesome. And so most of us, you know, everybody knows you guys are from Minnesota. Tell us a little bit about that and this, especially you know, real quick about like growing up there in the moto and so forth. Uh, we've seen a lot on your guys' family and so forth, and, and a lot of that great story. Donnie and I have always been big Ryan fans, you yeah. know, like, and so we always liked his, you know, just everything about Donnie's got a huge, you know, number five <laughs> crush, <laughs> but it's it's well deserved. He, he just, and, and a lot of it has to do with the way he would act, you know, uh, and the way he would present himself. But growing up that way, uh, tell us what, what that, and when, when growing up, what brought you into mechanicking, so to speak, you know? Yeah, growing up, I mean, when we got serious around 
85s 125s i mean we all had between me and my brothers we had 12 bikes so my dad was always pouring concrete and he'd always help us set you know when he was done with work but i started like oh i'll start helping dad on bikes and then he kind of taught me just little little tricks and stuff and it's kind of just grew into a passion and yeah yeah as a mini dad right all the mini dads are mechanics that's really yeah so how much older are you than ryan i'm 35 and i think ryan just turned 33 sort of like a year and a half close to two years so you guys be riding together a lot yeah we, we always ride and then our little brother he was probably five six years younger than us he's pretty much the reason why we, we all had bikes because he he uh, did good at loretta's and he got us actually a uh, the amateur Suzuki or support ride. Okay, that's funny. I didn't. I don't know if I realized that. Yeah, yeah. So the first time I ever saw Ryan in person ra racing, I think, was in Mammoth. Actually, he came up. He was yeah. on the amateur team with Cole Grass, and they had brought him out. And we're, like they're bringing this guy from back east out, which which isn't normal for Lorette for Mammoth back then. Yeah, you know, yeah. it wasn't normal to bring in because it's kind of a West Coast race. Yeah. You know, Mammoth is over the years. You know, you wouldn't get a lot of people from you know back east but he brought him out there and i think he did really well yeah i think he was battling with mcgrath and he was all stoked <laughs> i don't think mcgrath was stoked having this little young guy on his butt but uh yeah i think that was his first time even going to california and okay they brought the box fan up and him and my dad went and yeah, it was a pretty fun trip hold on i saw though back a little bit before i think that like oh four oh five you were racing pro at that time right yep yep I was, so yeah. there was like a minnesota state champion or supercross championship or something like yeah, that. yeah we, we raced our local we had this little supercross series and uh it was local right by the house and we'd always ride there and and uh, so were you faster than ryan at that point? at one point i was faster and then when ryan got on to 250fs then he started kicking my butt but, <laughs> i see okay but it took him until then it wasn't like he was beating you on an 85 no no we all progressed and you know was i was the fastest and then brian was the second fastest than our little brother and then it kind of tiptoed and Ryan kicked our butts. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> All right, very cool. So, um, and then when, when you're growing up, when did you realize, hey, I'm not going to keep progressing at, at racing, right? Like, yeah, uh, I turned I turned about 18, and I'm like, you know what? It's either go to school, or you know, I just I'm, a lot of my buddies were racing, and I just I didn't want to go down the route and just be a privateer. So I ended up being actually went to school to be a uh, carpenter or a cabinet builder. Okay. And then I, I went to school, did that for two years, and I was working in a cabinet shop, and I watched my boss get his thumb cut off that day. <laughs> he was cutting the wood wrong, and uh, Ryan called me, a coincidence, called me that day. He's like, hey, I need a practice mechanic, because he just signed with Suzuki, and, and he was going to be riding in Minnesota. So I said, yeah, let's let's make it happen, and it's kind of went from there. Did you so, negotiate a deal with him? Was he paying you? I think it? I was getting like 100 <laughs> bucks a week or something. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Big money. Big money. Living yeah. at home? Yeah, lived at home. So, you know, I was so that's how there. you got started was being Ryan's practice mechanic on, when his first 250 deal yep. kind of thing? Yep. They yep. Set his, he signed in 06, and then 07 I started as practice mechanic. And then uh, 07 to 09 I was his practice mechanic. And then came back home, poured some concrete with my dad, and then moved out to California and got a, got a ride out at a, a job ride at KTM. So... So when you were a practice mechanic on that 250, that bike, that was the Kawasaki Suzuki. Remember that that first right in there? Right? Actually, it was right after that. He rode, he rode the when he first signed it was 0506 chassis, and yeah. then the next year was the aluminum when it was just a Suzuki. Yeah, and that's the bike I got to work on, and that thing was pretty trick. I mean, you just did grips and graphics, so <laughs> it was it was a lot better then. But when it was that Cowie version, that steel frame one. That bike was rough. You know, yeah, was, I actually, we one of my first four strokes was that Kawasaki uh, <laughs> was an 05, and yeah, we it was our first time working on four strokes. We had a lot of problems, <laughs> boo, <Boom, Yeah. laughs> boo, overheating and stuff. It was a, uh, it was tough. It was tough, and you didn't, didn't know all the stuff you know. Somebody now. didn't like Mitch or somebody bring in like a Porsche mechanic engineer to kind of figure those four strokes oh, out. Yeah, or yeah they had that. Uh, I forget his name. Drano was Drano, his name. Drano, yeah, that, Drano was Reno like a italian maybe or something. he came from i think toyota engineering and yeah. then he basically was like made one of the main reasons why they were so good because he had four strokes like yeah. the back of his hand they were so advanced they got those things dialed yeah. so yeah. so you enjoyed doing that and then when you came out like to california to work with ktm what, what year was that well actually i came out to california in 09 and i actually was dating my wife uh and her, her brother's Grant Langston. Mm -hmm. So they actually, her mom and dad got me a job at Langston Motorsports. So I worked <laughs> there for, uh, I think it was like six, seven months. And then her uncle, uh, Andrew Langston, he yep. was getting ready to move into the engine department. Well, he put my name in to be Mike Brown's mechanic for the off-road team. 
So that's kind of how I got my foot in the door at KTM. That's perfect. That's yeah. perfect. So you, you know, all them. And Andrew, Andrew's awesome. He still does uh, most of my crank rebuilds. Yeah, yeah. He, he knows what he's doing. He's awesome. So you got him, and so you learned a lot from from all of them, and of course having a, you know, was it, is he an eight time champ or so? Yeah, yeah. 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 With, with GL, so it, it's kind of fun. Se seven, it really, if you count Supermoto. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that that's really cool, and then. Uh, when you, when you get over to KTM off-road, well, how long did you do with the off-road segments? So I was on off-road from end of 09 to 2011. I did two years with Brownie. And then my brother had signed with uh, KTM. And I, I really just, my passion was just supercross, motocross, <laughs> like any most mechanics. So I got my foot in the door. And then I was the test mechanic for a couple of years. And then just kind of progressed, learned learned tricks from Carlos, Frankie, Raj, yeah. Ian, you know, all the little trinkets they've learned. And they kind of put me under their wing and taught me in this who was your first rider was it dean ferris was that my first red bull ktm rider was dean ferris and then i had uh justin hill and then after hill i was uh, trey canard brock tickle and then i left to go to geico honda with uh to check with chase sex and only because i was going to be in-house that year like test mechanic and i was like i'm still young i want to be a mechanic so i <laughs> was still eager so i went to geico honda and then i followed chase to factory honda and then i just couldn't do the drive anymore it was like five hours round trip driving from marietta to, to la every to, day so like that's back home to catch so did you get did you get matched with chase by chance yeah i just i at the time it was dan betley he was the team manager and, and i just i wanted to work for a rider so i um i think originally it was supposed to be for hunter lawrence he said but then something had happened and they they needed a mechanic for uh chase i was like yeah let's let's go for it so well, that worked out because you got a championship. Yeah, we got two championships yeah. in Supercross. Our first year we won, and then the second year yeah. we backed it up, and then uh, they moved us over to the factory Honda rig, and, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a good experience. Well, and I will say, for whatever it's worth, just knowing the way business works, you had to keep relationships pretty good with KTM to be able to go back there. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I always <laughs> if I ever leave somewhere, I always try to leave on good terms, and, and KTM's always, they were always good to me, and, and the, the whole reason I left the first time was just I just wanted a rider and that was just me being selfish and i just was young <laughs> did and, they try uh, to keep you staying there or, yeah, yeah they were bummed when i left but it was just at the end of the day it's just business and, and yeah, they're, yeah. they're cool they, they've been around a long time they get it so. and, and roger and ian are pretty awesome as far oh, as like, they're really good dudes they're, and everybody over there is pretty cool so it's it's really a nice atmosphere it looks yeah. like and then they see they work hard but i guess most of the teams do but i definitely see it yeah like they if you you know if your goal is to win on saturday but if you you know if the riders having problems they're sunday their brains are thinking and monday morning they're in the machine shop or they're, they're they'll, they'll make it happen they just the winning's their passion i mean like yeah. any team but these guys they live to win so <laughs> that, that, it's, it's awesome that's There's, what i noticed okay so now you're out here in marietta california still and you got wife and kids yeah i got wife and then uh two kids and yeah and you're totally great what now what are you still enjoying the traveling to races and all that yeah most teams our team's very fortunate. They give us a day off during the week, and, and I'm fortunate. I have a practice mechanic in Florida, so he takes care of AP when he's not in California. So if I had to do both, I don't think my wife would let me uh, do this. So. <laughs> so you definitely get some more time during the week. Yeah, once spend. once we're racing, it gets quiet. Like off-season, they're in California, so I am wide open, but it evens itself out during during race season. So well, very I get cool. my schedule. All right. Well, what we do here is answer questions. And so we, we don't want to get too far off of base. And uh, so Spencer and Donnie are going to fire me some questions. Most of all these questions, really, I've already emailed the guys back. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't leave them hanging. You know? <laughs> so they don't have to wait like a few weeks or a month to get their answer. So we try to, we try to help people out. When they email us questions, uh, we got a few different people. You'll even know some of them that, I, that I'll get some help from. Some of them are, and then some, you just are really tough. But, uh, uh, you know, good bike maintenance is one of the one of the problems. I guess that before we get too far started, what you know, have you thought about like as, now that you're a factory guy compared to you know, especially when you see recreational beginner guys or when you guys were first starting, what what do you think the biggest thing or things that people don't do or do wrong to their bikes, even if they're just recreational riding or just basic racing that they don't do enough of and then are bummed when they're you know bikes not working or whatever. no one from when we were younger that we, we just didn't know you don't you just back then you'd have youtube and stuff to do that stuff as, as for me it was grease like we yeah. didn't we had grease and you but you didn't know to do the bolts the link <laughs> you know like you just you just pop on and ride it right so i'd say yeah i'd say grease that's one of the biggest preventative yeah. you you're building ap's bikes from scratch 
Yeah, all, all of all of the bikes at KTM they they're built out of parts, so everything comes comes from uh, the ground up. How many bikes them. do you think you're building a year? Um, well, each each guy has uh, a race bike, but that race bike gets rebuilt every weekend. I, I'd say through the whole year we probably go through the chassis themselves probably 15 but they're getting rebuilt every 30 so hours so my point is now how many buckets of grease are you going through? you go through a lot of tubes of grease <laughs> That's yeah, what I'm saying, like, everybody's got their own little niche that they like to put on the bike but yeah just grease and high pressure lube on the bolts and hey so real quick then for, before i forget then so for supercross what's your schedule like let's tell people your schedule i guess that'd yeah. be really fun you guys fly out to let's, let's start when you fly out to the race yes yeah, so like if, if everything's going smooth and your rider's yep. happy and you're not reinventing the wheel you usually uh you go to the shop on Tuesday and then get your parts, whatever you need to rebuild your bike, put in your suitcase. And then Wednesday, not most teams, but our team, we get a travel day. So we take Wednesday off with the family and then we fly out Thursday, fly all day Thursday. And then Friday, we set up the tent, make sure the race bike's all good because we built it the pre previous weekend. And then Saturday, go racing. And, and usually Saturday, if everything's, you did your job right, Saturday's kind of like a day off because like, you're, you're just making sure the bike's clean, checking your chain and stuff, and if the rider's happy, it's pretty smooth yeah, sailing. Ra race day's easy for you. Yeah, race what, day what, is, is like what he's day. saying. He's just washing bike in between practices. It looks like the busiest day, too. Yeah. People think it is, but it's actually easy. It's actually then su Sunday. We get up usually, get the truck at 7.30, and the whole bike comes apart down to the frame, and, and, and that's the day. It's kind of like the where you do most of your work and make sure you you know put the bike back together, make sure nothing's broke or anything, and then Are fly. you putting a new engine in? That we, we go... Most teams nowadays they go two races per. per uh, they go two races on an engine. And it's more just preventative maintenance. R right. They'll send it back to the shop, put new uh, gaskets just to make sure nothing's broke or anything. But usually, like with KTM, we have a system like our bikes go thirty hours, no problem on practice bikes. So it's it's just all hours. But so then on Sunday, you're if you're away, you're there all day working yeah, on the bike. You, around we start at seven and uh, a normal build for us if it's not a mutter, it's we're done by like four or five o'clock, but you're in the semi and you have everything you need, solvent tank parts, so it's it's, it's really new, quick. New suspension on? We go two races on suspension. Okay. Like I said, it's you could go more, but it's just more just to make sure right. everything's solid and then we usually do plastic, chain guides, chain, just more cosmetic stuff. To make the bike look pretty but and what would be the difference for outdoor what is the how's the schedule change? Uh, uh, it's about the same we come in build sunday fly home monday and then do it all over again the next week so similar deal yeah but now will you will motors and suspension go as long uh, yeah we, we try to stick to the same schedule okay. on outdoors Su motocross we maybe might do one race and then keep freshening it up just because of the heat just it's right depending on on the race but the first part of the season it's usually cool out so we try to go a couple races but yeah now, and I've seen the, and you've been in there to the race, to the engine build shop. Oh, yeah. And, and I got a buddy in there that, that works. And it's just awesome when they, you know, seeing how they tear those things down. And what's really cool is what he's saying. When they tear those engines down, 99% of the time, they just look like new. Yeah. You know, everything. So it, it is preventative. They're just making sure everything's perfect. And Well, the shop looks like new. Well, it is new. And, but the and, shop looks like new. And most of the parts <laughs> get re, you know, reused. They have, they have time limits on things. We'll get, and some parts will just go right back in. And some parts will get timed out after a certain amount of time. So yeah. I think it's really right, cool. it'll trickle down to practice bike and then eventually time out. But yeah, there's they have a system and it's yeah, it's awesome. Knock on wood, it's, it's been good. So that's true. I mean as far as DNS go, I mean honestly most of the bikes in factory teams nowadays, man, you hardly 250 F's yeah. a little bit more. We'll see a few things. We've seen a few, yeah. few guys, and we don't got to mention anything. But we've seen a few over the. And and, and honestly, I, I know some of the bikes. It's some of the bikes are maybe pushing it a little bit harder than what their stock bike. That's how the 250 class yeah. is. You're trying to get every ounce every. of power. So like you're on the limit. And if on the KTM side, we try to be a little bit on the safer side. But yeah. like it's just you're trying to risk it for the biscuit. You, you, <laughs> you want them as much power you can and it's a competitive class and it's just part of racing. Oh. Your brother has probably the record for the weirdest, uh, <laughs> I don't say DNS, but fit, like his chain came off that one time, his gas cap came off. The gas like, cap. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, the shock. The, the shock. Yeah. The yeah. shock uh, and then his ignition deal. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't there when you, I was on KTM right when he was at Suzuki when he had those problems, but the a lot of the problems when he had at KTM was just like it was a new bike. Yeah. And you Oh yeah, like I was mentioning, that was all the yeah. old bike that yeah you, know, you don't know until you go racing and, and we've learned from that but uh it's crazy you, you can never mimic practice what you do at the race like s stuff you happen at the race you'll never even have happen at all it's it's crazy same with loretta's i remember we go to loretta lens and 
stuff that happened there. You're like, how does this even happen? It just happens at that race. Yeah, I, I, I can test to that as well. So, All right, Spencer, you want to get us going with a question or two? Yeah, all right. right, I'll get us going with a question. All right, so James H. says, thanks for providing great content for Awesome Sport. The topic of spark arrestor inserts seems to trigger a lot of people. I'm simply reaching out for your advice. Um, I love my 2024 YZ450. I just installed an FMF system. What are the downsides performance-wise, if any, of completely removing the spark arrestor? I like the sound of it removed, and I only ride closed course moto tracks. I don't want to sacrifice performance for weight and sound. Just curious if you know the difference between how that bike will run with the spark arrestor in or out. I'd rather not cut the screen out. Thanks again for your time. Sounds All like right. he doesn't mind going deaf, like removing that. Right. Thing. But yeah, so we get this a lot because on uh, the FMF has a really cool system. When you put it in, it has a little ring, a spiral ring to clip it in, which is really cool. And so we've shown it on Instagram a, a bunch of times and people just kind of lose their minds. Uh, they, they, you guys like to see it, that it's cool. But then there's a lot of guys who are going, man, now you're breaking the law, you know, whatever. It's like, hold on. We're riding at Glen Helen, riding at private tracks. So you don't have to have this in if you're riding it, you know, if you're not riding any place that requires it. So that's the first thing, is you're not breaking any laws by having this out of the bike when you're at a track. Okay, so, and let, now there are a few tracks that do require it, like Gorman was one. You know, I think they're kind of closed, but some some places will require. As far as our 250Fs and 350s, we typically will take it out. It just, get, just kind of gives it a really good feel. And, but on the 450s, and we kind of like having it in, and we do cut the, the screen off just so it flows better and makes less heat. What we notice with it in, if you're riding it hard like moto, it gets really hot at the end cap. Now, if you're trail riding, it's not as big a deal, but if you're riding it hard uh, trail. Now, so that's my thoughts there. What, 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 what I thought of this question was that you guys, you guys are probably tuning and playing for different reasons with sound. Yeah, the biggest to, thing is sound for us. Like yeah. a lot of the privateers, they'll take that out and you probably make your bike faster and stuff, mm -hmm. but then the decimals go way up. So mm -hmm. we'll get the sound, sound tech in the morning and a lot of the guys who don't have the inserts are way over. Yep. They blow, you know, blow past the decimal limit. But f for us, that's basically just for sound limit. But yeah. now you guys play with different uh, inserts um, on your, on your, uh, you guys we, run different. We can, but usually we just run whatever our, our company supplies with us. Yeah. Just give us our best foot forward. But it, we can tune a little bit. But the big thing is a lot of teams will go smaller just to meet sound requirements. Yeah. So. so they have to, especially, you know, these, and it's a little tougher on that sound to get through. And when they tech it, they actually mark the end of it. So it's, it's actually yeah. marked in there. So you can't remove it after yeah. tech. Yep. If, if you moved it, then they'll see the paint mark. All right. What, what do we got next? All right. Uh, Frederico D. Hello. Would like to ask you a question. The rear wheel of my KTM SXF 250. 2023 fits the Husqvarna FC 250 2023. Are any modifications needed? No. So that's what's really nice about the KTM brands of bikes. All that stuff's interchangeable. And 2324 is a new generation size axle, that new bike. But you can run your old wheels in the new bike with uh, different spacers. That's all it takes. And, and honestly, you can go back to like, you know, late 90s early 2000s ktm wheels and you can just get different spacers yeah, the hub, i think the hub's the same it's just yeah different wheel colors or yeah spacers and stuff what yeah. about wheels for you guys how long will you guys run a set of wheels oh yeah um honestly practice bikes we go 30 hours uh race bikes it's more cosmetic like yeah we want me. the sponsors want their stuff to look good and, and we want it to look good too so will those turn over to practice wheels honestly no i'll, I'll keep the hub we just cut the spokes and yep. hoops and then we'll just relace them at the shop and we 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 try to go probably a whole season on a set of hubs we get each guy gets three sets of of wheels so we just kind of alternate every weekend so there's really not much time being put on one set of hub it gets dispersed over three sets and what about like maintenance on on the hoop i mean like do you find them like super cross versus outdoors then uh, bending or it depends on rider like if a guy cases something <laughs> then you're gonna most likely have to replace it but if you got a guy who's smooth and um make sure to keep up on your spoke torquing and everything and or the manufacturer they sent us a, a torque they wanted at and make sure everything's greased up good it's it's pretty easy yeah and you build your own wheels yeah, the DID, they're actually our new sponsor for our team, and they send uh, the hub. They make a hub, spoke, and a hoop, and uh, they send us all the parts, and we kind of do it ourselves. That's so, great. That's great. That's nice. All right, next. Awesome. So this comes from Wenf G. He has a uh, CRF 450X in 07, so older 
Four fifty X. He got a Trail Tech fan, and he's trying to bend the tank. Oh yeah, to fit for the fan because you kind of gotta yeah. do some modification here. And he put a hole in his tank. Ooh, Tanks yeah. in the garbage. <laughs> uh, he says, "I'm sure I did something wrong, and I'm wondering if you might be able to give me some advice. I'm hoping not to do the same to the replacement that I just ordered." Love your videos. Thank you very much. And so we've we've bent tanks. We we we've done this. And and we're, I got a question for you on tanks. We'll get to after this because I it made me think when I was reading this question uh, last night. I was like that that'll be interesting. But with tanks, uh, we use the IMS tank, and then on that bike you have to bend it back a little bit. So what we do is obviously before there's any fuel in it on the ground, we heat it up with a heat gun yeah. uh, or a torch. We get it really hot, and then I have. But what it, what he probably used was something very small. To, to push on it we get something big i, I was thinking uh like the head of a hammer yeah, like a ball mean, yeah. like a ball peen hammer like a big one that you can push against there or, or something that you can hold down and then i have somebody with an ice uh, ice water with ice actually ice cubes in it and everything and so once i i just hold it in that position and you don't you want to make it you don't want to get it too hot that's the key so you can almost touch your hand against it like i have gloves on but i just would barely touch it and it's it's pretty hot you know you're like okay it's warm and you can just push on it and see it move in and then pour the pour the cold water on there and just hold it there while that cold water melts into that position um and and that's it and it's going to leave a nice smooth and and i think what his mistake was he probably got it too hot and he probably used something a little bit smaller like maybe a screwdriver or something and then it poked through so unfortunately like you said there's no repairing it i get questions on that too about repairing plastic tanks uh, there's no way i mean yeah. it's nothing i've ever found there's no magic wand to fix a plastic no. tank that that's that has a problem and i'm sure you over the years we've had the you know the you know the plastic tanks uh, not old hondas and cowies it would you know the, the insert would spin yeah, for, yeah for your yeah. shroud um so you know those i found a few fixes for those you know like, you know, like fix it you know hack get fix you, it yeah, yeah. but they'll get you by so uh, on those one one fix we found that was really cool that we did is we filled it with a jb weld type putty as a different one but a putty we filled it with epoxy and then just drilled a little hole and in, in there and then got a ktm screw and we used ktm screws oh, a little wood screw yeah yeah, yeah we those just wood the, screws are badass yeah <laughs> so we used the ktm screw because we used to make fun of the ktm screws when they first i totally made fun of them and oh my, my buddy that rides a kx he's like always i go dude those screws are the best i've never in the had world. one ever had one come out they're the best it's, it's like it's funny we every weekend like it's it it's kind of known, but the mechanics, we trade stuff like if I need something for yeah. them. Like, hey, I'll give you these rubber straps. But yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised. Like Honda, Cowie, they all get wood screws we trade out for them. And they use them in their like mud flaps or air They boxes. want the screws. Just because it's every week and you're tearing apart and the yeah. Phillips screwdrivers... You know the little six is just boom comes right yeah. out so and it's light the aluminum there are uh, some you, you there's different screws there's the aluminum yep. ones that are really light they weigh like nothing yep so anyway so that's one little fix in the tanks now as far as tanks i was gonna ask you over the years one one, mm -hmm. one little trick i don't think a lot of guys know is on um, over the years uh, especially with the four stroke well even two strokes but the the si especially outdoor like a southwick yep. that the size of the tank can actually be an issue for pro riders have you ever seen guys uh, try to make the tanks bigger yeah back in the day when i was on off-road I brownie. I remember brownie would race some select motocrosses, but I knew the tank wouldn't go, and and we didn't really have back then have access to bigger motocross tanks unless you wanted to show up with your big off road right. IMS tank. But I, th I mean, if I remember right, we would take boiling hot water, pour it in the tank, and then blow air in it, and you'd try to get a couple more liters or whatever just to. It wasn't big, but it was enough to kind of get you through. Yeah, that was like an older. Trick would you do all. that on the bike so that? the shrouds and everything fit i mean like, it wasn't enough for it would like oh, okay. wouldn't fit you could just kind of get a little bit more out of it but nowadays all the four strokes i think like honda and kawasaki they end up putting bigger tanks on just because uh, to meet their requirements but at ktm we're pretty i'll have probably four four liters some tracks on outdoors left and yeah. we get good gas mileage so it's not really a problem for us yeah so you have plenty even an after an outdoor you got plenty of fuel left yeah like for us like most race teams southwick and red butter are too like just because the heat and and just the tracks and yeah kate for us at least we're we got probably three three liters left at the end so, of the moto. so so guys are topping off at the line on yeah those. we always top off just, just to, to be safe. just to be safe or if there's like a red flag or something right right and even even supercross i most guys measure their fuel i just i pour it in because like if there's a red flag <laughs> or restart you're gonna be able to add to yeah i'm just like all right well, no i'm good so yeah Right. All right, very cool. All right, what do we got next? All right, Bernie L. I've been out of the game for some time and just recently purchased a 24 KX 450. I know Rotella was always okay to use in the older bikes. Is it still the case for the newer machines? Thanks for your time. Yes. Yeah, no problem. We use that. Uh, you you probably have a sponsor, so I'm not going to put you on the spot. But yes, and and there's many many teams over the years and builders who have used that and still use it. So and we've 
use it. And but just, there was some talk that the Rotella formula changed yeah. like two or three years ago. Yeah, four or five. I think four or five years ago yeah. even. And so there's talk. We haven't seen, personally, we haven't seen any difference in how it works. So I, I, we're, we're still using it. Yeah, 15, was it 1540 is really good for the, the yeah. four strokes. You know, it's funny. I remember uh, Dave Miller, you know, DMC. Mm-hmm. I think he tested every single like um, shell fire and ice and mobile one and all this. And, and it kind of came to the same conclusion. Well, I know some of the race teams have, but I'm not going to say anything because I, I know. But uh, I, I know that that Rotel is really good. And 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 even some of the race teams had used it in the past while they were, you know, they're, while their other oil companies were coming up with other stuff. So yeah. it works well. And, and it's really inexpensive. And so one of the advantages, guys, well, why don't you, you want to spend much? Well, it's a conventional oil, so it's really good on the clutches. It's not, it's, a lot of synthetics will will glaze the clutches, if guys, especially if guys are hard on it. So it, it's really good on clutches. And since it's cheap, you don't feel bad about changing your oil quite often. And that, you know, yeah, this prevents people when they go to their local motorcycle shop and a quart of oil is. $16, $18. Sixteen, eighteen dollars. Right. It's like they don't. They're like, I don't want to change it because of that. Yeah. It's it, yeah. I think we get it at Sam's Club, and it's around fourteen to fifteen dollars when we get six of them at once, six yeah. gallons at one time. You used to be able to buy the big fi- uh, five gallon bucket <laughs> right. at Walmart when we were younger. <laughs> I get the two and a half gallon buckets, and, and, and I put them and I pour it into the gallon. Oh, that's <laughs> small. Yeah. So so anyway, it's 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 a great option for guys to keep you changing your oil off, and that's another thing. I mean. With regular, and I even had a guy write me this morning, and he, he said he missed an oil change, and he, his oil was pretty. They put too much time on it. And he was asking how to flush it out. Well, whenever I've burnt a clutch, which isn't too often, but I sometimes I there's a hill that I keep trying over and over, and so and and, and like on a two stroke three hundred, I just and and first of all, KTM clutches are kind of hard to burn up for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I yeah, mean we're pretty, we're pretty lucky, yeah. right? They are. I mean, like they're. But I did burn up a three hundred one, and I've burned up some three fifty ones. But it's usually just because I'm going up this hill, and then I can't get to the shifter in time to get down to second. So I just fanning it in third <laughs> to get up there. So I burn up. And so what we'll do is we'll put in to so we dump that oil, and I'm putting the clutch. Put, yeah. So I'll, but but before I change it, I'll put in like I'll change the oil, and then I'll put in like three quarters of the amount. And I'll put in like eight hundred or whatever. Run it for like two or three minutes, and then dump it out. Just get it hot. Dump it out. Do that once or twice to where it starts to come out looking and not smelling like puke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Then I'll I'll dump it and then and then do it. Uh, so that's one thing that, we, that we've done on uh, you know. But but oil changes regularly is a big thing. And some bikes are different. One thing, the Yamaha 250F, good bike, but it only holds 800. We put in like 840. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, no joke. Even with me riding it, one hour, it doesn't matter what oil I put in there, one hour, it's black. That's like, how, yeah, I think a lot of, for a KTM too, like if you have like the, I don't know if the Yamaha is the same, but like uh, if you just have their uh, internal clutch parts, the we found that the, if you go to hints and your oil stays clear cleaner yeah but if you have the stock parts that for some odd reason it just makes the oil dirty and it, you think your oil's bad but it's not it's just the contaminants yeah so this is maybe a dumb question do you guys like at a supercross will you change oil throughout the day ever no it, it, you you learn an off season if your guy's good or bad on the clutch and and for my my guys ap is really good on the clutch so i know i can go two days without changing oil in supercross so motocross we do we do change it after practice just because like it's hot out most races but there'll be some outdoors like colorado if it's chilly i don't touch i don't touch a thing in the engine no and, but you don't change a, the clutch or anything no but if it's a muddy if it's a muddy first moto would you do it in between motos if, it, if it's muddy or it's hot like say red bud or or if it's a really bad mutter you will change it just to be safe but yeah. if it's a mutter and you know the guy's not bad in the clutch and it's cold out chances are i probably won't change the yeah. oil because i know it's but if it's hot and it's mutter, then yeah. for sure I'll. Change. So it's a little bit off topic, but we t- uh, talked about this before. How bad is a bike like one of the mutters we had this year? How how bad is the bike like? I would say destroyed, but how it's many more is- cosmetic. Yeah. Like after San Francisco, my engine internals looked good. It was just rocks got in the cases, and it just it was more rock damage, if anything. And then, uh, yeah, the rocks got in the brakes, screwed the hangers. It was just more cosmetic, but internally everything. The engines actually stayed pretty cool just because it was cold out really now on those races you know like you were saying you're staying sticking to your two races if you were in between schedule you probably would change that schedule. yeah i got lucky because we did anaheim one and then it was san fran so i needed a new engine so i just it was the luck of the draw but if it would have been a oh. butter and i would just it would have been then you would have changed the schedule yeah. a little bit okay all right what do we got next boys i think we should do product spotlight oh yeah 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 well product spotlight right here so and Jade isn't familiar with this tire yet. This is if you were if you were still in off road, you know all about this tire. Yep. This is the AT82. This is taking the place of 81. 
So 81's been on, like, if you bought an XCF, yep, yep. Or it would, this is what would come up, was an 81. 82 is bi-directional, and so it has this edge right here for the soft, and you, and you have a straight edge right here that they're saying for, for more harder pack. We've only been running it so far in this scoopy position, just because I think we like the, uh, you know, the appeal of that, because it just looks meaty, right? So far, we've, we've been running it, and we really like it. One of the advantages of off-road tires uh, in this, over the years, Dunlop's really never made specific off-road tires. Only since 81 has there really been specific off-road tires. They had the 952 for a little bit. It was a long-lasting tire. It's still available, actually, but it's... That was the first attempt. Now they have purpose-built off-road tires, and I think this is gonna be a really good tire for a lot of guys. Hey, would you grab that front over there? Yeah, yeah. So the front, what's really nice about this front, it's, it's a similar pattern as 3S that a lot of guys really like, and, and it's got a similar pattern. Uh, this front, um, a few guys have actually already tried this at Supercross, uh, just riding around. So I just sent this to my guy to test, and he's like, this is a good tire. I think he's going to race with it in Dallas this weekend. No way. Yeah, yeah. It's a small world. I didn't even know that. So that's really cool. So uh, this, it, it's it's really appealing to a lot of guys. It's going to be a, a, a wide range of terrain. And so we, we have it on a couple bikes and really impressed so far. So I think this 82 is going to be a great option for guys. And who are cross even even in some areas on motocross and and uh, and e obviously for off road. So and we'll have more time on that tire throughout the uh, this this coming up of you know fall and winter. Are both those spring. released already? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, they're out and available. Uh, so they're out there, and we have a actually this weekend, and we built a Dunlop AT82 bike that I shot with Dirt Bike Magazine. Oh, it's, it's really so I got a 350 XCF, a, a new one, a new 24, and it's my favorite bike a 350 xcf I to me and, and donnie we're, we think this bike is the best overall bike that bike all we do is an ecu jamie at twisted helps us with an ecu we do that and then just some basic other mods and the things are incredible so i'm gonna have that bike on display this weekend at uh glenn helen on sunday they're doing the sra the picture back here yeah right. oh yeah yeah this is oh, donnie's yeah his his it's it's awesome so he's got the 350 S sxf which we do and he keeps his orange i believe it or not i don't like orange all mine are <laughs> black and red or so, you're doing an all white one right now you're doing a white oh, one true. yeah yeah i mean so, do you see what i had up here jay i yeah. like it yeah <laughs> so he's all about the orange and and uh, i'm like hey we just there's enough orange out there. So now, because, and now, and what's funny is, I will say this, I didn't I mention this, I told, I've told Donnie this before, but when, Ro, when Ro, Roger and Ian went over to KTM, I, I, even at that point, and then when, and then when Ryan went over like a year later, I'm still like, man, there's no way, dude. There's, there's no way. Okay. Then they started doing well. Even when they started doing well, I'm like, well, that's just, they got, they just got, those, yeah, they yeah. got, they got Roger and they got Ian and they got a good rider, but I'm never going to own a KTM. Like for real, maybe I'd own a trail bike. Okay, and I think I, my first bike I bought was like a trail bike. Okay, we got like a two hundred, and you know, and then you know we got some other bikes. But now I own like a ton of KTM's. I, I what I have like eight or ten. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah I have like eight, I have EXCs. I have three. I have four something in the garage. Right. Five. So I know, and I would have bet somebody like in O, oh, you know, it even in twenty. 10 through 13, even through 13. So even that's only like 11 years ago, or like 13. And so I would have bet money that I would never own, you know. So what year KTM. did you go to KTM? 2009. 2009. I was there for PDS. <laughs> oh, you were there for <laughs> yeah. PDS. Were you, was there some discussion? I mean, like this is going deep <laughs> with Ryan about, hey, you're going to basically a not really proven brand in Supercross. I didn't really, I don't know. We didn't really talk. Talk, he just, I had to have my brownies bike at my house just because I'd have to go to a race. So I'd store it in my garage and he'd sit down like, oh, it feels pretty good. I think he was just excited for a change. I think. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and he, had, he had to have some good trust in Roger and Ian. I think he, I think that was the tough part for him in, in 11 because they left to yeah. go to KTM. And I think he had built such a good relationship that yeah. when they left, he was kind of like, not to discredit the guys around him, he was just kind of lost. Like he just put all his trust in there. Yeah. So when he got back together, you could have put him on any bike. I think he had Roger and Ian and, and, the brain's powerful i feel like in our sport like with yeah with the mental side oh and, for sure well honestly you know with those three guys ian roger and, and your brother it's basically the foundation of where ktm's today i, yeah. I feel like it made a big change for sure and would, would it have happened without maybe to some extent but i don't think that it does to the extent that it did i think it really was a perfect timing that he was able to to win you know coming over there and doing i think it. too yeah when you win especially in the 450 class when you oh. win it's you know what well, they say went on saturdays or went on sunday sell on monday yeah he but i think the biggest thing is they implemented it in the production because i think ktm like 
the before Rajini and era, there, there was it was always good people and stuff, yep. but I don't think the the product was up to where it needed to be racing. Mm -hmm. And I think they implemented a lot of stuff on the production side of things, and I think that's what's really took off and, and the lead time like they would call monday yeah. the part would be there by that following weekend it was just so compared to the japanese it well was, previously ktm relied uh, so heavily on the uh, uh, mxgp yeah. series that yeah. and those bikes were all one-offs that they're yeah, like yeah. look we're doing so good over here even right. granny can tell you he wrote yeah he wrote oh, yeah. he's like he had five different frames and he got here and he's like oh it's gonna be sick and he's like oh this is my this isn't you know, like, it was sick all right <laughs> yeah you're like oh dude so. <laughs> all right spence what do you got for us this comes from ASAP Huna. Oh yeah, he's, he's asked this yeah, before. Yeah, he a lot. Uh, we, we get some cool names on here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a specific maker model of a dirt bike that's proven difficult to work on more so than others? Thanks for answering questions. Okay, so one thing I've noticed, I don't know if, if you have, but because we work on a lot of the newer bikes, yeah. and one of the things we've noticed is that honestly, the newer the bikes, they kind of make things more hard. They, they, yeah. They, and it's like silly, because we, we work on these 95 CR 250s. I know you've built an old bike. Uh, you've built an old, yeah, older yeah. CR, right? So we, we built these older bikes. Everything was simple. You had two two T-handles to go do almost everything, right? You just go around maybe two, three. We were taking the linkage off of a Honda yesterday, and in, in, on the new KTM does the same thing. To get one of the linkage bolts out, you got to go loosen the, the chain guy, the, the, the chain slider. The, or the or the linkage bolt won't yeah. make it out. Yeah, how stupid was that? I'm like, it, on all the other bikes, if you just turn it, it had a cutaway, and you could just slide it out right under the chain slider. So now you have to undo another bolt on the chain slider to get it out. There's all these little things, and, and on the new generation bike, uh, KTM's getting the uh, the brake lever out. That's tough on the 250, <laughs> 450. I mean, I've always thought about if we have a DNF. Like, I'm, I don't. It's gonna be tough getting us out of here. Right. But I've learned if you take the shock, lift it up, and then you can. <laughs> <laughs> on the 17 450 KTM, you couldn't take off the header pipe yes, without, without taking off the take, shock. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's so, like, so, oh the, man. That got fixed, but yeah, the brake lever is, is but if you think about it, how often are you ever gonna bend a, a yeah. and, it, and if you bend one, chances are your guy's not riding, for sure not that moto. Yeah, he's gonna either be at that big of a crash or, yeah. yeah. That, you, you know, but but anyway, I would say that honestly, a lot of the newer bikes have gotten more more difficult, and, and also they're trying to move things around to be more centralized, like the, the ECU and different things. They're getting them in different locations instead of making them as easy as before. So I would say, I don't think that's any one brand that's harder to work on. Um, yeah, I think it's just they, you got all these young designers and they design stuff like, oh, it's yeah. cool, but they don't look at the function sometimes. Yeah. Like to me, when I was at Honda, they moved the battery by the engine. So yeah. you're like mm -hmm. trying to take an engine. I'm like, do I got a battery to take off? Now, like, they make it a little bit tougher to do almost in swaps every in case. Motos. Engineers have never worked on anything <laughs> in their life. Yeah, it's so it looks cool, but then you like go to the function of it. It's like it still functions good, but like it's tougher on the mechanic. We're having inside. an ECU well, like, bolted in between the tank. <laughs> and the engine and in the sun yeah, it's, it's four the box it's four bolts and they have a washer and a collar and two washers oh, yes. no, and they're not anticipating people changing ecus yeah. they're but, just thinking about your lo normal customer right going out for and, a sunday and so ride we go change an ecu and we're like oh this is a job <laughs> and so, so anyway they all are a little bit more difficult than they book used to hours be, at the mechanic shop go way <laughs> yeah, up yeah. Right. <laughs> so but the engines i will say one of the cool things about ktm engines is that uh, that stop so that you can be at top dead center and oh, lock the engine. Cool. Isn't, isn't that cool? You so take that for I got, a, I got him to smile KTM. there because, so, on a, and I don't do a ton of engine work, uh, but when you do on a KTM, uh, there's a bolt you can undo and then it has a washer on it. And I think they changed it for the new generation bike. You just have to get a different longer Yeah, you bolt. just get a longer one. And then yeah. it's got in the crank, it's got like a little cutout, cutout for top dead center. And then so you lock it and that motor is locked at top dead center. Uh, it's not moving. And so where the other bikes, any of the other bikes, they, they can move while you're working on them, which is kind of... It's tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a... I, I don't know why anyone else has never thought of this. Especially if you're doing in the bike. If you're out of the bike, it's not so tough. But if you're like at the track, like, oh, yeah. trying cams today, like, yeah. you take that thing for granted. Yeah, so that that's a really cool thing. So there are some cool things that some of the manufacturers are looking at like that. So, yeah. all right. That's awesome. Jeff J says, I finally made the jump to try the 2024 KTM 300 XCW. I haven't picked it up yet, but I've noticed the gearing is smaller than I've seen. I believe the rear sprocket's a 45. I've talked to two other guys that have gone up to a 47. I'm wondering what that would do. I don't have a lot of experience changing gearing, and I'd like to know your thoughts on what type of change you'd make. Okay, so first of all, this bike is really cool. This XCW, 
a lot of guys are bummed that it's not as fast as the XC, but they're different bikes. They used to be a lot closer and just a different transmission. And I, I was never a fan of XCWs because they have this wide ratio transmission that's kind of funky. But this 24, my buddy bought one. And it's actually at my house right now. We just did some mapping with uh, Jamie. Jamie actually mapped it just the other day. We, we've been waiting to do that. And he made a good improvement, which is really cool. The, so the XCW version still has the premix, uh, I mean, not the, the injector oil fill. Where oh, the, X, yeah, yeah. the XC, you premix it. Okay. So this bike, the gearing, it's got a 45 rear sprocket. It's tiny. But we rode it a bunch up in the uh, mountains, and I don't see any reason to change it. We rode it this summer, and we were in you know eight to ten thousand feet even, and it was carrying third gear everywhere. If they put that forty-seven on like his buddy, I think he'd be in fourth in places that yeah. you have no business being in fourth gear on. So. I'm always quick to want to change gearing, but on that bike, I would leave it alone. That, that 24 uh, 300 XCW is perfect. On our 350 XCFs, uh, on the new generation bike, we go up two. The stock is a 47, we go to a 49, and that's been working really good. We've been real happy with that. So that hopefully that helps them out. I, I, and if you're getting one of those bikes, you're gonna enjoy it. And the mapping, uh, if, if you're gonna get one, I would get with Jamie at Twisted. And we're gonna test, our next test on that bike is, the dome so it, he couldn't get the same top or similar top as an xc or sx um, and we looked at the part numbers everything's the same except the dome uh -huh. you know, the piston's the same so they, they this thing's got a ton of uh this thing's got a ton of room in there it's got no compression and so we're gonna get the we already ordered the sx dome which conveniently is like 45 bucks dude that's sick 45 <laughs> bucks so we're gonna we're gonna throw that in um I, I think we got you know seven or eight bucks in the head oil rings or whatever so we're gonna we're just going to throw that in and, and try that next. So a really cool bike, though. I think for a trail guy that's just doing single track and wants a two-stroke, that's the bike. We still prefer the 350 XCF. Doesn't sound or smell as cool, but... No, but, but man, that, I don't know, you can't go wrong with that bike. I know, I know. But the, that three, but the two-stroke guys, I can't argue with them that like it. But a, a lot of them are, you know, I don't know. They're, they're just... They're just stuck that's in there. Their, that's their position. Yeah. yeah. How do but, you guys determine gearing? Like, do you oh, have yeah. a chart from all different tracks? Like, I know Supercross is different, but like for outdoors, do you go, okay, at Millville, it's this and this, and then kind of go from there? Or how do you uh, do it? It's just based off your training, to, like how your tra transmission is. Like, we kind of have our base where we where we want to be. and But usually when, when the guys find a gearing, we don't really, we more do mapping because with nowadays with when you mess with the wheel position it kind of screws their suspension mm. and then we don't want to screw the suspension guys over mm -hmm. so we try to keep the wheel in one position and then we tinker with mapping and stuff you measure exactly where that wheel position is and try to keep it there and well every every weekend you rebuild the bike and it's we, we put Same new chains chain. on so it's new chain new um uh chain buffers and stuff so we always starts the same every weekend and then you probably lose probably goes back four or five millimeters throughout the day just with the chain and mm -hmm. everything loosening but uh but yeah, so we we need more do mapping once we find our. Gear. So can riders do riders notice that difference in the wheel moving back or forward in their suspension? Not, uh, I would say the younger ones starting out probably don't know it, but like your top guys, they'll they'll lose their noodle if you change change if you go forward because if you go forward it'll stiffen your shock. If you go back, it'll soften it. So it's very very finicky with these top guys i can move it an inch and wouldn't notice it <laughs> that's all i have i go all the way back I'm like, that's good <laughs> can rotate the blocks you'd be like huh yeah what <laughs> no this it's now a hill climb bike it's fine <laughs> <laughs> all right joe r i'd i love i would love a video on a new bike routine i know i've uh, you've talked about greasing bearings in previous videos yeah so what, what, i want to get your thoughts if, you, if somebody was to buy a brand new bike whatever brand doesn't matter what would the main things you'd want to do for maybe before you ride or within the first little bit of, of on i know that's the toughest part when guy has a brand new bike there's very few we're, we're fine doing it tearing it down but many guys they want to go ride it yeah know? like i got a new baby yeah no <laughs> i would do the head head stays the the yeah. triple clamp stairs very it almost looks like they just put a little drop of oil from the factory mm -hmm. i'd do that your linkage those are the probably the two things that i would do yep and and that's what we've noticed is and is the the steering stem bearings and the ktm has a better system of blocking water from yeah the new there. system's better for for water getting power yeah. washing in there. yeah but so this they, is across brands this is not oh, one yeah. brand only and we've it and seems like nobody 
Really and we've had good. brand new 23, 22s, you know, over the six months. And and uh, also another, we have bike washing videos. A lot of guys don't use compressed air when they're blowing their bike. Yeah, up. and that's Pick, especially for the EFI bikes. Even even on the factory level, guys yeah. get water in their connectors, and then they have bogs and stuff. And yeah, you don't realize how water and, and not blowing out your connectors. And yeah, the, stuff. the TPS at the throttle body. Yeah, all, all those types of things. So using compressed air. A lot of guys. A lot of times we don't wash bikes if we don't have. Hey, we can't blow it off after people don't understand it's like yeah. well hold on let's wash tomorrow morning we got if we're out of town or whatever so you want to have a compressor and be blowing that off we have videos talking about that but they, what he's talking about is and and they'll even we'll take the seat off if we were really in depth we'd take the tank off after we washed and blow everything and clean everything up um really nice right yeah yeah because yeah. so much stuff gets on you think your bike's clean and also you know we lay the bike down on both sides yeah, take, yeah. you know we have a little system we do uh when we've got people helping but we're making sure that all those connectors and yeah. and all the bearing areas are blown off so we're trying to get that water out of there as much as possible yeah especially for us on supercross you'd we rarely wash unless it's a mutter you just limit the amount of water getting in right motocross you have to do it because it's just that bad but you try not to like we'll put the I make a little seat pan from an old seat, cover it up, put a towel, so I'm trying oh, nice. to not oh, spray the connectors. Idea. Just as I don't want to get any water in there, as, as if I can, just to cause something else. And then a lot of people don't realize a lot of soaps they they are conductive and they can actually cause a lot of your problems mm. in electronics and stuff too. So. Interesting. So you made a seat base with no foam that's just a blocker. I just took an old seat base, yeah. like ATM seat base, took the foam off, put some duct tape on the holes, and then that's when I wash. I put a towel on the nice. ECU and just cover it up and nice. So, okay, that's awesome. Oh, that's good, we we yeah. to step up our game, Spence. I have, I have to try that. Yeah. <laughs> How about a three D printed like <laughs> electronics blocker? Block get somebody to make one to kind of. You be sorry. Yeah, like a lot, there's a lot of stuff nowadays on the race teams that's three D printed. Like yeah. yeah, there's guys three D printing like the air filter cover for. Do washing you guys it. have a printer? We don't. We outsource a lot of stuff yeah. at work, but there there's guys in departments who can have now, it at home. And I've heard it. stories. We don't want to mention, but I know that there's some teams that won't even wash their bikes with the electron with the electronics on. Yeah, I know there's there's a lot of teams in the pits that Pit they, you don't. They'll just scrape. Even if it's a super big mutter, they yeah. just scrape it off. They don't want any because yeah. they know it's a problem for them yeah. on the racing team side. So. Yep. You so need a, a, a guy that's just a mud scraper at those <laughs> races. <laughs> <laughs> but we hate we get used bikes. Spencer is uh, he's a test of this. We don't we don't race that regularly. We ride and yeah. if we if we race it's we ride a lot. Okay, but to get but we don't race a ton. We get these bikes. We buy get a used bike from somebody. It's it's only got like fifteen hours on it. But the the air get, they put new plastic on it. But the air box is all scraped up. <laughs> it's the worst thing looking ever. And I'm like oh so hey, I gotta buy it. I gotta buy new. If you're if you're racing vet forty out there. <laughs> Scraping your airbox is not going to make you go faster off the line. I promise you. <laughs> that, that's Don't our ruin your plastic. <laughs> so they scrape it with their plastic scraper, but it's got that's like sharp, and they're just digging. Yeah, they screw do a screwdriver. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, oh I've seen guys scrape the mud with screwdrivers. Oh, oh yeah. You're, first, you're not, make, you, you're not getting any uh, path in there at all. Well, I, I guess my, my theory is, and I think we were talking about this last show. My theory is, motocross guys want something to do when they're sitting around all day. Mm. You know, they got an hour or two or three or, or in some cases a day in between motos. You know? This yeah, is yeah. why I love these off road. I do, <laughs> right. I do in like and out. the works and big six and stuff. It's like you, I, in my race out. is at noon. I go there at 1130, I race and I go home. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So motocross guys want to tinker and do stuff, you know, so it makes them feel like that's what they're spraying their sticky chain lube on there while yeah. they're sitting around doing nothing. Yeah, this is the, this is the last question okay. for this episode. This comes from John K. We've, we've talked about this a little bit already. He says, I've wondered about this for several years, uh, especially in stadium supercross, say the top 450 riders, do they do a top end every week out of need or just because they can? Don't seem to be running the 450s very hard in the stadiums. I'm a 50 plus vet rider and I don't think about it um, as compared to what the manual says, which is 15 hours on a CRF 450. Thanks. Okay, so we touched a lot on this already as far as like what, what Jaden and, the, and the, the teams do, but as far as regular guys, one of the things I've noticed, and I've been around enough now, especially KTM guys, I've seen them tear engines apart, uh, 450 engines with 200, 300, 400 hours stock pistons. Yeah. And I've had guys write me with 350s, with, or trail riding 350s, XES, with 400 hours. Uh, guy up, uh, Joe in Wyoming, sends me these cool photos, and he put new rings on the piston. And I think this thing's still going strong, man. It's amazing. Full so, budge on that, huh? Yeah. Now, I will say that there are different qualities of components, you know, from valve train to rod, stock rod, stock piston, cylinder, uh, Nicosil, all those things contribute to how long things last, right? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I've noticed is that 
they're going to put in that book. I think what, what, they have some mistakes in the Honda 250 book. One of the mistakes is the first oil, they tell you to do an oil change at 15 hours and a piston at 15 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's really in the book. I'm like, somebody messed up this book. Yeah. <laughs> so the oil change was at 15 and then so is the piston. I'm like, okay. But anyway, so you have to look at that stuff. But uh, and the Kawasaki has really improved their kicks 450. They've improved to a plane bearing, uh, you know, uh, rod. So they, their their bottom ends are going way longer than they used to. They they would have problems, and guys were getting 50, 60 hours on a yeah. bottom end. Now they're getting you know well over 100 on for regular guys. Yeah, yeah. So for regular guys, I I our our theory it like. Say the Japanese bikes, I say, hey, you can get over 100 hours on a bottom end, and the pistons usually 80, 80 to 100. You know, now I don't want anybody. Yeah, they're killing us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, blaming me if their piston breaks. But your your book is the manual, and and those things are set for like a pro. You know, um, and now the KTM worst case scenario. Yeah, KTM bikes R 350s. I would have no problem doing 150 hours before I'd even think about turning it. And one one gauge I found is if bike starts to get hard to start, you know, check your valve clearance. The valve clearance is going to be something that's going to be an indicator that something's going wrong. Yeah, and that means you've <laughs> probably sucked dirt at one time, which is possible. I mean, that dirt twip. I always say that even though they're dirt bikes, they don't want dirt in there, you know. <laughs> and if you always check your, your your oil filters and stuff, if you got, you know, that's yep. always a good indicator if something's going up or. Yeah, and you can actually tear apart or cut the air filter and yep. look at the paper and see if you see any uh, brass or shavings. In, in aircraft it. maintenance, when they do yeah. an oil filter, they always cut those apart and always look for metal. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's great. All right, it's been a fun show, right? Yeah. So now, this part of the show, you're not going to totally understand here, but this is... We go you're too young. How, how old are you, Jade? <laughs> 30, 35. He, I, he's not even old enough, and he had to look up to yeah, think I about 87. it. Yeah, 87. I was born in 88. In 80. <laughs> so this is before, and my glasses are broken. You like this? Nice. I got one yeah, lens, one so I got to look with one. It's a monocle. What okay. happened to the other glass? It's, it's in the van or something. Just, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to throw it away. All right. So this is Def Leppard. This isn't... This is... The most commercially successful album for Def Leppard, 1987, and it, this is Hysteria, and it's just a like a perfect album. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. It's so good. Have you listened to this album? I probably heard songs, but not the album. All right, so we're gonna. I'll download it on iTunes. All right, we're gonna have to talk to you about. This All right, stuff. so it, it's just a perfect album. It's really good. Now I will say that I like the earlier albums with Pyromania and On Through the Night. Those albums, the earlier ones uh, with High and Dry and Stage Fright and all those, I, I do kind of like the harder rock then, but this is more appealing in long term. And a lot of the hard rock will have the best hard rock albums over the years. And it was kind of like over the years it would change, but it was like Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction was kind of the top album, right? Yeah. Okay, for hard rock guys. And over Metallica. the years, and, and, and then you get into the problem is Metallica with, 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 um, the black album right would go into that whole a little bit into the Me metal. Yeah, yeah into the thrash let's say but cause exactly. it appeals to both right but this album has kind of taken that over because i think because everybody's gotten older it's it's more uh what do you call it we're older so we got nostalgic all right spencer you're gonna have to read these for right, you i'm gonna read <laughs> yeah, yeah it's all right read, read off the uh, do you not have it memorized no i would no. expect you I, to i think i think we got women in uh, all right rocket ready yeah starts off women rocket Animal, Love Bites, Pour Some Sugar on Me, Armageddon It, Gods of War, Don't Shoot Shotgun, Run Riot, Hysteria, Excitable, Love and Affection. Yeah. I mean, Pour Some Sugar on Me. Come on now. Yeah. And then Love and Affection at the end is like yeah. a... It's, it's it's nearly a perfect album. It perfect, really is. Yeah. So, you know, nowadays, most people don't listen to albums in their entire... Yeah, there's like so, two songs and you're like... Oh. Right. So now this... So for us, when we grew up, we'd have it either... It was tapes before this, but then when we'd drive around, this would be in your... When it was a new album, it'd be in your deck. And if you're lucky enough to have a CD player in your truck, like I did. I had a six-disc changer. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> Under I the seat. Fancy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the last one of those just died in my F-250, so now I just don't even have a, a disc player. But anyway, I but I, I can put disc in there in my dvd player in there yeah okay so anyway you would just listen to it on repeat for the first three or four weeks that album came out and you would know you'd memorize every every song, song in order so a lot of times when there's a song on the radio and it, it's finishing or like on xm where i'm just, I, go, I can i'm starting to sing the next song like <laughs> with, with, but when you're tra when you were traveling then we had no serious xm so you had to do this yes yeah because there was no way to the fmf was painful uh, FM, the fm was painful <laughs> <laughs> fm <laughs> fm radio was painful you yeah. just you would just be oh there was only am in some places yes though. it was yeah. terrible so yeah. 
So anyway, uh, that album is just amazing. Uh, great album. You get cool pictures of you, all yeah, the, the... The album art, that's always a big thing when you would own a CD. Yep. And you'd ha you'd, you'd get all the notes, the well, liner something notes. something about owning a CD, right? Because if I have, you know, Spotify or whatever, let's say one day they're like, oh, we're going to pull our music from Spotify. Yeah. Oh, uh, you don't have it. You don't get to listen to it. And they do that. And they do that. And they do it. Every now and then, all of a sudden, you're like, I heard this last week, and now it's gone. And now it's gone. gone. So, but... So anyway, it. that's a great album. Uh, and we'll have to name the show. One of the we'll pick one of those songs. This, gonna be, this is going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be hard. We've had some hard ones. No, no. But probably it's, it's, it's going to be no, no. Pour, pour some sugar. Pour some me. sugar. You think it's going to be that? Oh yeah, that's, that's what it has to. That's, that's what, a long YouTube channel. Listen, it that's doesn't matter. I'm the one. So we name. The I'm show the one editing a song show. from. We name the show a song from the disc. Oh, that's sick. Yeah, we just we're just learning as we go, but that's kind of how it's. it's we got this little music segment at the end. <laughs> All right, and because know. it's because old guys work on bikes, I think, and, and and a lot of old guys, and then younger guys have caught on to the, when they hear that in our shop and stuff. And they're like, that's really cool. And they're asking, like, who sings that? Like, and it's really funny. <laughs> what vintage band is that? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's really cool. So um, anything else, Donnie? What do you, what's your last uh, parting yeah, shot I got, for I us? Got a, I got a question for you. So when you're working on a bike, you know, kind of go through your process when you start a project and finish it. Because I know that you you line a lot of things out. So kind of like what do you start laying out when you go into a project and how do you start laying that out? Well, I guess the big thing on these modern bikes, there's so little you have to do that it's it's typically, for, for us, it's it's mainly it, suspension is gonna be the one. So it's like, who am I gonna get to do suspension for us and what do we wanna change and make it better? Suspension and then next would be ECU on these fuel injected bikes. That's really the main things you need to do. And then, of course, we like to get, you know, not just a cool looking exhaust, but a one that sounds good as well. Some of the bikes, stock bikes nowadays, are almost unrideable with a stock exhaust on. The, the, the pitch is, it's not just that they're loud, but the pitch is yeah. deafening. Like, <laughs> there's a couple out there, especially in the 250s, well, even one of the 450s is so bad that it just hurts your ears when they come by with a stock muffler on. And you think it's blown out, that's what it sounds like. Stock, it sounds blown out. So we'll get that that exhaust on there. And then, like like Jade was saying, we, we have it stripped. Well, since When the suspension's off, we admit it immediately, we, we have a CRF we're doing right now. We have the suspension off, we have the swing arms off, linkages off. We've cleaned everything because the bike has like four or five hours on it. So we've cleaned everything and we're gonna grease everything, waltz apart, and the radiators, I got those off and I sent those to ICW. They strengthened them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Now on your guys' radiators and the race teams, do you guys just run stock or are they braced uh, up at all? No, we just run stock because if you usually figure, they if they break or they usually don't have much problem with the break in our bend and we just put new one. I mean, we're can good. you say like I don't know if you can say this or not? How many basically? How many bikes do you have on the truck in parts? Ah, uh, between bolts and parts, there's probably about six, seven of every part on that truck. Okay, but then that's shared throughout the team though. Yeah, yeah but with engines because it's cool KTM. I think a lot of manufacturers do this. There's one frame for 250, 450, 350. So it's yeah. It's, it actually helps us not have as many parts on the truck, so a lot of stuff's interchangeable. But yeah, I probably have like six, seven of every part on the truck, and then um, who who kind of organizes that truck? Because the mechanic, I, us mechanics. So do you each have your own section of drawers uh, there? No, it's it's basically like a mini parts room. So we all go yeah. and organize it. So it's try to make it home away from home. So you do it together. Yeah, I usually do it together. Yeah. So now, I noticed in the shop they have barcodes and they scan and check out parts, so you guys know the inventory. Yeah. So on like, the truck, how do you guys do that? First, on the truck, I just make sure I have enough on there, and then if it gets low, I just I just take Reorder. care of myself. But the way our our company works is we have a big parts room. Yeah. And it's an open warehouse, so then it's like you go to Target, you scan an <laughs> yeah. item, and then we get charged for it. So yeah. it's kind of we're able to have a lot of inventory, but we're not getting charged until we use it so it's kind of nice that way interesting it's so cool the parts I, I, was, I was looking at it when i did the tour in there uh really cool so then on the other bikes like on the two on the old bikes like on your bikes we've talked about and our crs and yours he he, he built a cr yeah yeah, yeah gorgeous yeah, yeah. So, so when you tear them down it's just basically it's just tearing them all the way down the frame and seeing what's broke bent or yeah. cracked or you know you just and what needs to be and some parts are kind of a lot of parts can be cleaned up, especially with vapor blasting now. Yeah, that vapor blaster is game changer. Yeah, and, and Sano Metal Finishing has a dry blasting. Have you seen that? I haven't seen that one. So he does a really good job with this. So he, it's a basically a vapor blast, like the same yeah. media, media, media material, but he does it in a dry cabinet. Oh, okay. And, and it does a totally different type of finish. Uh, um, and so he, he some stuff is better. So that's why he, he came up with this. So That's it's really cool. cool. That's smart. So he has two different tank, uh, yeah. you know, cabinets. 
So it's some stuff and, and will, will come out differently. And then he has a sandblast for sandblasting, which is you know the old yeah, school yeah. thing. He has that as well for like rusty parts or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, somebody's got some of that kind of stuff. So anyway, so that that's what we do on the old bikes. So. All right, that's all I got. All right, man. Awesome. Well, um, it's been awesome having you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pre appreciate First it. First guest ever. I'm really excited you're yeah. here. This is and you know I went through GL to yeah. He yeah. texts me. He's like, hey, can you just like heck yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. him and I do a lot of stuff together. And we took him riding this fall. Uh, we took GL and. And Donnie and, I, and Spencer met us there up in Utah. We went this epic trail oh, ride. Yeah, he's telling me he had oh, blast. Yeah, it, was, it was so much fun. Yeah, we, we, had, we had just two perfect days of trail riding. So one, hey, one quick GL story, the funniest thing. And, and Donnie, was, he, he was stoked that GL was this way. And so was my other buddy. Cause, so yeah, I would think that he would be kind of brave, right? We went to the second day. We went to this area that he needed great the first day. It was this gorgeous canyons. It's, it's a place called Green River. And it has just amazing sand, a mix of everything. The next day we go to this area that's like the like out of Wiley e. Coyote movie. Like, the, moon, like the moon. Like the moon. <laughs> it has these razorbacks, right? Yeah. Dude, he was screaming, dude. And we had we had Cardos on. We had, we, we run Cardos, uh, which are great to communicate with. He had the end, and, and he's just like, oh, I ain't doing that. He's afraid of heights. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, because when you do Christmas trees, or Christmas lights, he's always going on the ladder. He's scared to go up on the. Oh ladder. man, he did not like these Razorbacks are like I don't know how to explain it. They're kind of like Beaumont. Have you ever been it's like yeah, yeah. It's like Beaumont. It's like Beaumont, yeah. and they're just Razorbacks, but they're. But they're tall. They're you know you know fifty to sixty feet tall. And then you guys rode over to one that was like up the side of the mountain, and he was like, "Oh no, I'm not doing this." Yeah, that's funny. So it was pretty funny. So Sp so we had a group of like five or six of us, and Spencer and I are the only ones doing all these ridges. I did them. And did you do some of them? Donnie was doing some of them. Okay, but at the end, Donnie Donnie also crashed. Oh, twice yeah. the day before, so we're giving him the benefit <laughs> of the doubt. And and my buddy Jim I, was I just so stoked. Yeah. My, my, one of my buddy Jim was stoked yeah. that GL was like he's like so good and I kept telling Spencer shh don't say anything don't say anything on the Cardos because when they'd hear us I'm like just get him to come up here and <laughs> like but, trick them <laughs> try to get them to a razor back fearing their, like, for their lives they're just gonna go down and then leave and then that's what happened they all went back to the truck and then we we got back like 30 minutes later and we went on another loop where I did less Man. Razorbacks because that yeah. was nice it, 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 it's just a really cool area and that's it's sick. in it's in Utah and then there's this famous shot of Ken Block on a UTV doing a pivot around this like natural rock berm thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of bike jumps have been done out there. Tom Parsons does a lot of freestyle stuff out there and a bunch of other guys. And and uh, we got to that spot and just some neat areas. So anyway, it was really cool. He's fun to go. So hopefully uh, if, if next fall or... Come with you guys. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, in October, it just depends how much preseason testing you got going it's on. It's crazy. We got straight, or not straight rhythm, uh, supercross, motocross. And then if you're lucky, yeah. go to destinations. We don't, there's no more off season. No. You get maybe two weeks. So I guess that's a, I, we we're supposed to end the show, but how often do you get to ride? Do you, do you yeah. still want to ride? I don't have the itch anymore. I'm so out of shape. I oh. guess, uh, and if I get hurt, then I'm screwed for work. Yeah. With and that's, my hands. and now that is one thing I'll tell kids out there that want to be a mechanic is that this too. you're going to stop riding. Yeah. I mean, and all, what I've said over the years is because I'm, you know, old. Okay. I'm close to your dad's age. <laughs> I don't know if I'm older than your dad. My dad I, just turned 60. Oh, yeah. So I'm younger than your dad. But he just still, turned 60. And so I still enjoy riding a lot. We're going to go riding today. That's and, good, though. Yeah, enjoy that's and have fun. And, and the problem is a lot of the guys in the industry, like he just said, immediate ones, hey, I'm not in shape. I, I, he's not going to be able to do it long. Because with riding, you need to be riding it regularly. Yeah. People don't understand if you're not riding once a week minimum, uh, you know, a minimum of once a month. But if you're not riding once a week, yes. you're not kind of being safe, right? That's yeah, another thing. Yeah. You don't feel safe. So you go out there and I go, oh, I'm going to go to Glen Helen. I'm like, I'm riding around a bunch of guys that ride all the time. Yeah, yeah. And you don't feel Especially safe. Especially for riders who have, like you, who have, who have in the past gone very fast. Well, it's like my brain remembers. You're like, my body can't I was up. like, I was this fast at one time, <laughs> and you like maybe try to do that, and it's just not right, and right? Then it just boom like yeah. that. And you're on the ground. So, and, and then the other thing he said immediately was, if, if I get hurt, I'm done. He can't. He yeah. can't be at the track with a broken wrist or yeah, yeah no, sc we're screwed for yeah. work. All right. So. Well, listen, we got to finish up. We're an hour. It's the longest episode. We're it's over quick, an hour. Into yeah, we're this. over an hour. Quick. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, guys. <laughs> Hopefully, you enjoy. Like, comment, subscribe, all that kind of stuff, and uh, we'll see you next time. See ya. We work with some great companies, and here's a list of those right now. Dunlop Motorcycle Tires, Wysco Piston, Vinco Air Shocks and Dirt Bike Parts, FMF Exhaust, Decal Works Graphics, Pro X Racing Parts, Recluse Clutch Revolution, Motion Pro Specialty Motorcycle Tools, Works Connection, Uni Filter, Klotz Oil, Kometic Gasket, MX Plastics, 
JE Pistons, Cardo Systems, ODI Bars and Grips. And remember, if you shop Rocky Mountain, use our link from our site, Linktree, or link in the description of the videos. Thanks for watching and listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.